Shalom TV's coverage of the 2014 APAC Policy Conference is made possible in part by Naomi Vilko, MD, in memory of her father, William Vilko, and in memory of her other relatives who perished in the Shoah. Anti-Israel activity has been a, become a regular phenomenon on college campuses around the country. Amid this anti-Israel animus, APAC trained student activists are working vigilantly to educate campus leaders and engage student government representatives in pro-Israel political activism. Joining us to discuss the challenges and opportunities for pro-Israel students are four of APAC's most accomplished campus activists. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Galit Krifter. If you know me, you know that I am a person of action, um, but not just action, well thought out, carefully evaluated, goal-oriented action. And that is what has led me here today. Um, it's been a part of my life forever. Um, the first thing that I think about in terms of myself is my love for America and being a US citizen. I am so proud of our country. Um, and I love the political process. And growing up in DC, that love for the political process, that love for democracy, um, being here in this city, I've been able to turn that into action. The first time I lobbied, I was 12 years old. Um, I walked into the Hill, knocked on the door of my congressman, and um, allowing, having the opportunity to have this face-to-face -face conversation with someone in power um, was just incredible and inspiring to me. Um, and I continued this love for democracy and the political process, especially trying to get my peers involved um, in advocacy and helping every one of my friends understand that they have a voice. Um, and again, being in DC, I've had the incredible opportunity to work on a bunch of campaigns, um, work on financial strategy for that, and work with organizations that use social media um, and social networks to get my friends involved in the political process. Um, so first and foremost, I am an American. Another part, a really important part of my identity um, is the modern Orthodox Jew. And those are the values and the beliefs that guide my day-to-day -day actions. Um, growing up in an amazing modern Orthodox community of Potomac, Maryland, half an hour away from here, um, and also having this pluralistic mindset um, that was given to me by the Charles Smith Jewish Day School, um, also about half an hour away from here, great school, <laughs> um, I was raised with these values, I was raised with these beliefs, and in every action that I take, they are my guide. Um, and the same way that democracy is a core part of being an American, and the political process is a core part of democracy, for me, a core part of Judaism was love of Israel. Um, I've been to Israel many, many times. The first time I went is when I was six years old. I went there for six months, so it was a pretty good first trip. Um, didn't, run, didn't, didn't really want to leave. Um, and I've been back more times than I can count. Um, I you know, grew up in a family where Israel was really, really important to us, important to me. And um, some, something that I knew I had to fight for. So when I always ask, you know, how do I take action towards this belief and love for the state of Israel, the answer for me that I always received was APAC. I grew up in an APAC family, I am very proud to say that. Um, both my parents, who are here today, um, are very much involved. My father served on National Council, my mom currently serves on National Council, and I'm really excited to say that this upcoming year I will be serving with her on National Council. She has always been my role model, um, someone I want to emulate. Um, but beyond action, as I said, you have to take careful consideration. So when I was told that the answer is APAC, I wasn't just gonna take that at face value, I had to find it out for myself. And my first foot in the door, um, besides for apparently being snuck into policy conference when I was 10 years old, 
I didn't know about that, but I was just reminded of that, so that's pretty cool. Um, I uh, went on an APAC high school summit when I was a senior in high school, and I, it turned out that my parents were absolutely right. I found a place where I was told that as a high school student, my voice mattered. I was taught for two days about the importance of the U.S. as a relationship, and I was taught how to take action. And beyond just the words that I was told by the APAC professionals, as well as the college students who came to High School Summit to teach us as high school students, and it's pretty cool because um, this past year I actually staffed High School Summit and I was one of those college students. Crazy cycle. Um, the, the third day of High School Summit, we actually went to the Hill and we lobbied our representatives about the importance of the U.S.-Israel relationship. And the question is, why did they listen? How old was I? I was I mean, only a few years ago, really, but, but, but when you see young students, high school students, why does it matter what they have to say? Why do our representatives take us seriously? Again, the answer is APAC, because they know that if you are APAC trained, you know your stuff. You're going to bring resources, and you're going to bring facts. You're going to bring information that is relevant and that is useful. And you're not just coming out of nowhere. You really have the resources to back up what you have to say. Um, so what I realized that at that time um, was that I was able to take action, I was encouraged to take action, and fighting on behalf of Israel was not only my action as a Jew, but it was my action as an American. And everything just fell into place. It all came together for me. I took a little bit of a break from being an American. Um, I took a gap year in between high school and college, and then my love for Israel was only solidified. I was willing to do anything it took to protect my country, um, to protect the state of Israel. Um, I wanted to join the army, you know, the cute soldiers. That's an awesome way to, to be of service to the country, but my mom wasn't so happy about that. Um, so as I came back, um, to the United States as a college student, super excited to be at the University of Pennsylvania, I asked my brother, who was a current student there, he's only a year older than I am, what can I do, how can I help? And luckily, there were a lot of answers. I am on an amazing campus for Israel activism. We have so many groups that are dedicated to Israel, to Israeli culture, to Israeli people, the Israeli economy, um, but he knows me, and he knows that Talking about Israeli culture isn't enough for me. I needed to take action. So he recommended that I follow in his footsteps and join the Penn Israel Public Affairs Committee. This was not the obvious step, considering the Penn Israel Public Affairs Committee had just been founded that year. It is only three years old. My brother was one of the founding members. Um, a few of them are also here today, which is really exciting. And when I asked him to tell me a little about what he does, I was floored immediately by what he was speaking about. A BDS conference um, uh, was held at Penn the year that PIPAC was founded. And you would think that that would be troublesome for these amazing founding members. Um, it wasn't. We took a proactive approach, and now so many of the campuses that are fighting BDS are following the model that PIPAC founded in that first year. BDS was the way that we created our foundation. And when I say we, I mean PIPAC in general. I wasn't actually there. Um, only speak from, from what I heard from my predecessors. But within that first year, something amazing happened. Students came together. They took action. And it has only continued from there. Little did I know that two years later, after I agreed to be a part of PIPAC, I would be sitting up here today, a member of our cadre, our executive board, um, an upcoming member of National Council, and someone who, whose love for Israel and love for the U.S.'s relationship has only grown so much. Um, and I'd like to say, first of all, that any one of the PIPAC cadre members, anyone from PIPAC could be sitting in my place today. This is an incredible, incredible group of students who I've learned so much for from during my experience in PIPAC. I'm just speaking for all of them, and many of the accomplishments I'm about to speak about um, are theirs and not necessarily mine, though it is very much a group effort between all of us. Um, so a little bit about what we do on our campus. Um, today, and, and then I'll take you through the rundown of some of the challenges that we faced. Um, my title is Campus Relations Coordinator of the Penn Israel Public Affairs Committee. It is a mouthful, mouthful. <laughs> uh, 
Um, and what that means is I meet with student leaders on our campus and I talk to them about the importance of the U.S. Israel relationship. And wh again, why does that matter? Why is that important? Because at a school like Penn, our student leaders are going to be the thought leaders, are going to be the important figures of the next generation. And if today we can start them with a relationship with Israel, we can give them a face that they can turn to at any time when they struggle with U.S. Israel relationship, when they have any questions, then in the future, in 20 years, in 30 years, when they're in Congress, when they are making important decisions, they can come back and they can ask those questions to their college friends who they already have a relationship with. And for me, that is incredibly important. Um, this year we had a leadership statement. We had 80, 80 student leaders, 80 of our top student leaders on our campus sign on to a statement that says student leaders at the University of Pennsylvania support a strong U.S.-Israel relationship. In addition to those 80 student leaders, we had both of our senators and the mayor of Philadelphia signed on. In addition to those statements, 17 of those leaders gave their own personal statements, their own personal reasons why they supported the U.S. Israel relationship. These are not just people who are signing on to a piece of paper. These student leaders can now articulate their reasons for their support of the U.S. Israel relationship. And that is not something that's going to stop anytime soon. Those are relationships that are extremely important to us. Um, in addition to our leadership statement, um, we lobby the same way that um, all of you will be doing tomorrow. Um, we have uh, relationships with 13 offices in our area. Um, we constantly email them, we send them news articles, we visit them, we talk to them. Um, in our most recent visit to Senator Casey's office, um, one of his staffers called us the top student organization in the Commonwealth, which was really exciting. Um, they don't hear from students that often and they really love it. So when we go speak to them about the importance of the U.S.-Israel relationship, they listen. Um, so in, in addition to student leaders, the leaders of today, we have leaders of tomorrow. Um, and finally, in addition to that, we are trying to create a core of advocates, of the future advocates. We have weekly newsletters with opinion articles written by our own students, weekly seminars led by our own students that deal with so many variety, with a large variety of issues having to do with the U.S. Israel relationship. Um, and what this means is that if something happens on our campus, if we are called upon to face opponents of the U.S. Israel relationship, there is no way that they can stop us. Because we have a core, we have a base, we have a foundation of advocates and supporters across campus who stand with us today and will stand with us tomorrow. I am a Texas boy. Uh, I was born in Lufkin, Texas, and moved to Louisiana when I reached my 10th grade year of high school. And when I got to Louisiana, I met a man. Um, his name now is um, Bishop Darren Sovas Sr. Um, it was then Pastor, um, but he's been elevated. And Pastor Sofas, Bishop now Sofas, he loved the state of Israel. And the amazing thing is that in New Iberia, Louisiana, um, the topic about Israel is very rare. You know, you're in a small town um, that's um, near, about two hours away from New Orleans, Louisiana, which in about an hour from Baton Rouge, which is the next biggest city in Lafayette, about 10 minutes down the road. Um, and for an African-American pastor um, to discuss such a topic and be so excited and energized about it, you're looking at a rare phenomenon. And he would bring in um, rabbis and he would host um, conferences, Hebraic conferences, um, to inspire us and teach us and educate us on our Jewish roots um, so that we would understand biblically um, how um, we are related. And everyone would call him crazy. Um, no one would show up. Um, the only people that would show up were the ministers that he made come. <laughs> and, you know, and there were times where even, you know, the members would, you know, say things, you know, Pastor, why are you doing this? You know, why are you doing this? And he would always respond. He would say, because you don't really know who you are in God if you do not know your Jewish brothers and sisters. And so then, 15 years old, 
you know, I continued to listen, continued to listen, and, um, and it began to sink in and make sense for me. And at 11 years old, I began to preach. I became a minister at 11 and was licensed um, at 14 and was ordained as a reverend at 20 years old. And I had to find my place, you know, and literally come to grips with, okay, who am I? Um, what do I represent? And, and what would be my message? You know, what would be, you know, the character that I embrace in my own personal life? And so I, um, you know, went to college, Grambling State University. Going to Grambling, there were a lot of opportunities afforded, and I received an email, and it was from Andy Aarons. Andy, you know, he reached out to everybody. He had a national campaign going. You know, even though he, you know, represented the HBCUs, um, I think he tapped into everybody's colleges at some point. Um, but Andy reached out to me and asked me to come to the policy conference. And like most people, my initial response was a free trip to D.C. <laughs> and you know, I love D.C. I want to live here. And, and so I said, yes, I'll come. And that was with without even reading what he was asking me to come to. <laughs> and when I read and researched and went on the website and, you know, and read some of the information that he sent me, I found out more and more um, how excited I was to come to policy conference because I was coming to something that, to some degree, I was interested in. Um, and to some degree, I had some type of affiliation with prior. And so came the policy conference, and I paused for a second because that's literally how I looked when I walked in um, the arena, and it was absolutely the biggest conference I ever been to. And this was last year, you all. Um, I'm, I'm not old, um, and this was last year. And so I came in and seen all of the screens on the walls and all of the people walking in, and it amazed me. Um, to see so many people come together for one cause, for one cause, for one state, um, for one love, and that is that we may see the nation, the state of Israel, safe and secure. And that, that inspired me. And so I went through, and of course I was excited because Vice President Biden was going to be here too, so, you know. And so I was really excited about that, and, you know, and they changed it up last year. You know, the bathrooms were closer to the stage, as were this year. They put them in the back. So I had a system going that every time someone famous got on the stage, I went to the bathroom. Um, so that when they came off stage, I could get a picture. <laughs> And so I did that and, you know, I listened and I listened and I listened and I was inspired more and more and more. And anybody who knows me personally knows that I love to network and when there's an opportunity, I jump on it. And so I overheard a conversation um, that um, there was a trip to Israel. And anybody who knows me knows that I love to travel. And, and anytime I hear the word free, <laughs> if you love free, raise your hand. <laughs> And so they said there's a free trip to Israel, and you know, and so I begin to process everything, and so I start running to the right people, and you know, letting them know I, I wanted to go to Israel, I wanted to have this experience, because though, from 15 year old, 15 years old to now, I have heard so much about Israel, and you know, and I begin to develop a passion for the people of Israel, for the Jewish people, um, that in essence I wanted to actually experience the very thing that I'm running around saying that I love. You know, it's kind of hard, you know, to love something that you've never actually experienced. And so I wanted to fall in love with the idea of supporting the nation of Israel. And so I applied um, for the trip and I was selected to go. And so last May, through the first few days of June, I and my lovely friends, um, y'all, you see them in the back, y'all say hello to them. Uh, we all went to Israel. And I was elated, honored, um, humbled at the same time um, to go to the state of Israel. And we flew over and we landed and we tore the state of Israel up, <laughs> literally. And so we, we, went, we went and we experienced all the great things. And so from a biblical perspective, Israel was dear to me there. You know? And so I began to see the same things that I read about. You know, you begin to see 
the shepherds herding sheep. And you begin to see, um, you know, some of the, the places, Jericho, you hear about Jericho, and you hear about Jerusalem, and you hear about um, 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 the Sea of Galilee. You know, we took a cruise on the Sea of Galilee, and that was amazing for me, because I began to say, this is the same water that Jesus walked on. And, you know, and we went to all of the historical sites, and we went to um, the burial places. And, and then beyond the biblical perspective, I begin to understand more about the geopolitical perspective. And some of the things that the state of Israel faced um, from a political um, view. Um, that the idea that this small country is resting, living in a neighborhood where there are people, there are countries around them that despise them. That literally have agendas to destroy them. So I begin to process that. I begin to think about that even more, that if you can imagine you know, living in a place where every day when you woke up that you had to worry about a bomb or a rocket, that this may not be another day that will come. There may not be another day that will come, that this could be my last day living, that as a parent, the idea that my children every day are in danger. So I began to process that. And because of that, it pushed me even more. It pushed me even more. So I came back to Grambling, went back to Grambling. And when I went, I shared my story with other people that were around me. Um, I will be honest, I did not hold or host events, did not host activities. That was not my way, that was not my perspective, that was not my method of reaching students. Um, for me, it was having personal conversations with students about my experience. And so from being the only Grambling Night at, at the policy conference this year, I believe there are nine of us that are here this year. And so it went a little bit further, and Andy reached out to me again. He said, look, I, we're trying to push out a statement um, for HBCUs, historically back colleges and universities, um, to come together and, you know, and promote the fact that we support a strong U.S.-Israel relationship. And so we begin to push things out to the rest of the SGA presidents um, at HBCUs. And I believe, if it's not my mistake, this year we have close to 60 or more um, with the help of other SGA presidents um, from historically black colleges that have pushed the same message. Together, we've been able to bring over 60, is that correct, y'all? 60 historically black colleges and universities to the policy conference this year. And not only that, but the thing that makes me so excited is that at Grambling, we have a lab school, a high school. And so not only has it branched out to colleges and universities, but we were able to even empower the, and inspire the SGA president at the Grambling Laboratory High School to be at policy conference with us this year. And he's sitting right here on the front row, and that's Darian Williams. And so that entire experience has inspired me as an individual. Israel has inspired me as an individual. Um, you know, not just my work on campus when I was there, but in my personal life. I seen how persistent and triumphant, prevailing people of Israel are. And because of that, I went through a hard time in my life and I was fired from my job. I'm a fresh graduate and in December I was already fired. I was fired from my job, and it wasn't because I wasn't good. There was other things, so in just case you want to hire me, yeah, I'm a good employee. <laughs> but I was fired from my job, and, but there was a dream that I've always wanted, and that was to develop my own corporation, my own business. And, and I had a decision to make, and that was whether I was going to pursue my dream or go and work for someone else and deal and suffer, you know, once more. Anybody who has an entrepreneurship spirit, you know it's a suffering time to work for somebody else. And so I thought about the people of Israel, and I thought about how prevailing they were, strong, triumphant, and mighty they were. And when I began to reflect on that, I said that if the people of Israel, if the Jewish people can struggle, fight, 
and still believe in a state, in their own democracy, then surely if they can make that come to fruition and for it to manifest, then my dream of owning my own business, Dream Again Empire, surely it can come to pass. And so I'm excited to say today that I own Dream Again Empire. And it has been because of my affiliation and my fervor for the people of Israel that has inspired me to chase my own dream. And because of that, I tell you today that the people of Israel should and I believe has been an inspiration to each and every one of you and that no matter what the challenges are because the people of Israel have faced challenges that you can do it, that you can make it, that you can achieve it. And APAC is a testament of that, that from 5,000 people to now 14,000 people it's been because of the ability for people to come together for one vision for one statement, for one love, for one cause, for two countries. <laughs> Together, 14,000, we raise a voice that says, I am pro-Israel, I am APAC. And I love that statement, and I love you. Thank you for your time. Hi everyone, um, my name is Lila Greenberg. I go to the University of Wisconsin-Madison. So for those of you that didn't hear my story yesterday, I grew up in St. Louis, Missouri, um, in a very Zionist household. Yes, yeah, St. Louis. Um, I was really interested in Israel and really interested in politics, but I didn't quite understand the intersection of those two. Um, it wasn't until my sophomore year when my dad passed away that I was inspired by a state representative who showed up at his funeral and said, you know, your father had a dream for you and it was, you know, to do what you want with your life and really follow this passion for Israel and politics and see where it takes you. And what that has manifested itself in is APAC. So I got involved my senior year, APAC sent a speaker to my synagogue and I walked up to this woman, her name was Emily Berman, and I said, APAC doesn't have any internship information on the website. And she said, who are you? And I explained, you know, I'm from St. Louis, Missouri. I didn't go to a Jewish public or Jew, Jewish private school. I didn't, there was no pro-Israel political organization for teenagers. There wasn't really even an Israel organization for teenagers at all. And I wanted to be involved. And she said, call Eric Gallagher, the APAC early engagement director. And I thought, wow, APAC has someone working for them that deals with high school students. So I gave him a call and I said, my name's Lila, I want to be involved. And he said, you know, we have limited funding, we have a high school conference, I'm not sure if we can send you this year. Try to get involved in Jewish life, try to get involved in political life. And I said, well, I am involved in both of those, what else can I do? And he said, we're really gonna try to get you out there. And they did, and thank God, because I would not be here today. So I walked into high school summit and I was immediately sold. People ask why APAC, there is no other organization out there that is as effective as APAC. If you want to support the US-Israel relationship, if you want to have an impact, the way to do that, the only way to do that is through APAC. So um, APAC has the saying, it's not about who you know, it's about who knows you. And um, I really took that to heart. I became really close with my field organizer, Vinnie Foster, off the bat, and we built a relationship to where I call him probably too much. But um, <laughs> we're in constant communication, and he works with me, and APAC is able to give me the resources to be effective on my campus. So, um, you know, some people ask, where would I be without APAC? And that's a really hard question to answer. APAC is you know, a lot of what I think about, and it's a lot of what we do on campus. Um, I wouldn't know my member of Congress. Some of you saw today, yesterday. Um, we have a very close relationship with Representative Mark Pocan of Wisconsin. I would not know his office. I would not have engaged college Democrats and college Republicans of Wisconsin. I would not serve on student government today if it wasn't for APAC. Um, and that's the biggest difference, you know. Most students don't vote. We get a bad rep. Students don't vote. Mm -hmm. Most students, if they do vote, don't get involved on campaigns or any type of political involvement at all. Most students will never write a letter to their member of Congress, let alone have their member of Congress know their name. So, you know, us four up here, we're part of the 0.1% in a way. Um, and I think that's really unique and remarkable. Um, but mostly what I want to focus on is um, what we're doing on campus. So. 
I know you guys have heard of the BDS movement, Boycott Divestment Sanctions. And um, we were faced with a situation last semester on the University of Wisconsin-Madison campus. The United States Student Association is a student lobby that works on student issues at the local, state, and national level. So what that means is they deal with things like student debt, tuition caps, student loans, and make, making sure that the student voice is represented. They work was represented, they work with student governments all across the country. Now our student government was voting to become full members of this organization, um, not because of any anti-Israel push they had, but because this is an organization that gives resources to schools. However, what we knew, what they didn't know, is that USSA also publishes 29 policy papers, one of which says fund education, not oppression, and asserts that we should divert all foreign aid currently going to Israel and send it to higher education. Other policy papers included the student position on US foreign policy in Africa. So if you can find a consensus on students who know foreign policy in Africa, feel free to lobby on that, but there isn't a consensus. And the consensus on Israel is that students are overwhelmingly pro-Israel across the country. So to assert that the student voice was saying we should divert foreign aid is ludicrous. And if I didn't have APAC training, I would have been extremely emotional. And I was very upset that this organization that said they were representing student voices could assert something so anti-Israel. But what my APAC training taught me, and the most important lesson that I have taken from APAC over the years, is to start at the end and look at our goal. So instead of ripping the policy paper to shreds and saying everything that was wrong with it and how amazing of a country Israel is that we all know Israel to be, we took a step back and we said, what is at the core of this issue? The core of this issue is that our student government represents our student voice on campus, and funding this organization would disenfranchise us as students of UW-Madison. So we built a coalition because we couldn't go to student government alone. Um, and we worked with College Dems, College Republicans, Badgers for Israel, and the Bipartisan Issues Group, and we had testimony from each organization instead of just our own pro-Israel voice at the student government hearing saying, this is what we care about. You will be disenfranchising our voice if you make this vote. Please vote against funding USSA. And we won by three votes. But it wasn't about student government being anti-Israel. It wasn't that anyone sitting on student government even knew these policy papers existed. That was our job on campus, was to be looking out for things like secret policy papers as part of an organization or you know, filling in those gaps for student government because their main focus isn't Israel and it's never going to be Israel. But what we have to do is fill in those gaps with student leaders like college Dems, like college Republicans, like student government and make sure that they're informed that Israel is such an important issue for students on campus and we do that work. So we send out a monthly newsletter to our congressmen, our college Dems and our college Republicans and our student government on campus giving a campus update, a legislative update and an Israel update and making sure that they know we will take care of educating you, we will take care of giving you resources because we are APAC trained and we know how to get things done on campus. So, thank you. My name is Omer Ramil. I'm currently at UC Santa Barbara and I just sort of want to begin my part in this by discussing with you why I'm a passionate pro-Israel activist. So who here has heard the phrase, US and Israel have shared values? Hopefully everybody. And I think that the story of my father really epitomizes that. My father was born in Moldova during Soviet Union, and he faced rampant, violent anti-Semitism. He still has a broken nose to show it. I see it every day. And when he was 17, him and his family hopped on a train, and they went to Israel. And now when I'm speaking about shared values, the two I want to focus on is that the United States and Israel being a land of refuge and a land of opportunity. For my father, Israel was a land of refuge. He escaped a horrible climate, a toxic climate, and he went to a place where he could survive. In Israel, in a span of 15 years, he found a wife, he served in the military, and he got a computer science degree. And he really enjoyed his time there. He loved the state of Israel. But he thought, OK, my wife is American. America is not that far. Let's go see what America has to offer. So at age 40, oh, let me rewind this. He went to Israel speaking no Hebrew, so he had to learn Hebrew also. He did that in a few weeks, a few months, a year. And he goes to America at age 40. Problem is, he does not speak English either. And so here he is, a father of one, a husband of one, with no job, 
no English, just passion, a degree in computer science, and a dream. And that is where America became his land of opportunity. He worked his way up from the bottom, working six day weeks, six to six, getting paid the salary of someone around 10 years younger than him, but he worked through it. And today, he's successful in the high-tech industry over in Silicon Valley. So I've really seen that my father's story, his life path, he went through Israel, it was a land of refuge, a land where he learned and lived and loved and set his roots. And then he went to America, which became his land of opportunity. And that sort of epitomizes the US-Israel relationship. There are two countries that are the homeland for so many people, and I've seen so many families, millions of families who have the same story to tell. So first of all, that's why I'm passionate about the US-Israel relationship, the United States of America, and the state of Israel. Now the bigger question is, what have I done with that passion? Up to around a year ago, I'll tell you not much. I was studying abroad in Israel, and I came back after six months for a wedding, and my grandparents who were involved with APAC told me, hey, grandson, you, you went to Israel, you love Israel, you learned about Israel, you're an American, you love America, you study political science. You should try to intern at APAC. And I asked them, silly, in a silly way, well, okay, APAC, I understand what they do, but how could I fit in there? And they knew somebody who knew about the internship opportunity. So I applied, and eventually I was accepted. And two weeks after I came, one week after I came back from Israel studying abroad, I went to DC to start this whole APAC internship. And a little plug, the application is due in one week from now. For all those of you interested, please apply. And what I learned from this internship was the APAC methodology. I learned how to speak and write and research and to be goal-oriented and goal-driven. For the past six months, I've been able to use those tools on my campus. And I go to University of California, Santa Barbara. We sort of have a history of having a strong presence of anti-Israel activity. And last year, when I was in Israel, eating falafel or in Tel Aviv, my campus delegates over there, headed by Daniel Dekner, had a sort of a run-in with BDS. And they're all APAC trained. And they knew BDS was coming. And they actively engaged our student leaders, like every other speaker up here has, and told them the truth. They educated them. They let them know their position and why they should vote against divestment. And they were successful. They beat BDS last year and has not come up yet. And in addition to that, they have actively engaged themselves in the political process and campaigned and worked for student leaders who understand the U.S.'s relationship is vital. And right now there's a majority of, US, of senators who support the U.S.'s relationship. And now where do I fall in all this? Freshman year, you could have caught me yelling at a wall. I was physically yelling at the apartheid wall with slurs and slogans and lies. And I had no impact whatsoever. I was in an argument in the middle of campus looking silly, looking absolutely silly. And then if you look at me my senior year, I went lobbying to my member of Congress. And we published a leadership statement with over 20 signatures of student leaders on campus. And we mobilized when the US-Israel relationship called for it. We have called members of Congress over 100 times, have sent dozens of emails, and really have been able to vocalize our support for the U.S.-Israel relationship and for APAC. And so in this short span of time, following a life of passion, I've really been able to, through APAC methodology, to apply my passion into something tangible, something that we've seen active results in, and something that I'm really proud about. And in four weeks' time, I've been lucky enough to have been offered the opportunity to continue my pro-Israel activism in a professional capacity. So I will be able to work with phenomenal students like Mr. Jonathan Allen in enhancing the U.S.-Israel relationship. And that's my APAC story, so thank you. From the first moment that we interact with students, whether they come to us in college or in high school, we speak to them about three horizons. We let them know that the work they do with APAC on campus is just prelude to a lifetime of opportunities to maintain and strengthen the U.S.-Israel alliance. And that for those who truly care about the U.S.-Israel relationship, who are not making Aliyah and 50% of my leadership development 
professionals have made Aliyah in the last 10 years. But for those who are not making Aliyah, they should think about the horizons available to them. They can be policymakers. They can serve on the board of directors or national council or city councils of APAC. Or they can join the APAC professional staff. And we like to think that the Diamond Summer Internship is a perfect opportunity for young people to explore not only how else they can contribute as students, but begin to envision themselves in different roles in the future. And invariably, there comes a time when we invite the Diamond Summer interns to travel with us to the seventh floor of the APAC headquarters and to go into the dedicated room where APAC's magnificent board of directors meets every 30 days for three days and to try the seats on for size. And when they go to lobby their representatives to imagine themselves in the ultimate positions of influence because as they learn, the best way of influencing the way a decision is made is to make it yourself. And more than once, I've caught somebody sitting in my seat, and that's just fine by me. It's not for me to say where these four magnificent young people will end up. In fact, I'm completely agnostic on it, as long as it's one of those three horizons. Yes? Hi, I'm Noga Finkelstein. I'm from Memphis, Tennessee. Um, I wanted to ask you, um, if and if there are, what differences lie in the way you advocate on your respective college campuses um, since you have different student populations and different um, denominations and different perspectives that each student has or each student group has? How do you, I guess, what is unique about the way you advocate on your college campuses? I'll say for me, of course, attending an HBCU, um, I know what my, my peers respond best to. Um, the most effective approach to engage a student that attends an HBCU is exposure. You expose them um, to what you're saying and they respond better. Um, but if I attempt to just give them a whole bunch of knowledge, um, a whole bunch of book, textbook information, then they're going to be more apt to push back. I mean, so, you know, what you do is you, you share the experiences. Um, you, you create an opportunity for them to, to come to policy conference. And when you do that, then they go back and the numbers generate from there. And they're able to share those experiences. So we do better when we share experiences. Um, and so I, I realized that was the best approach for me, which is why I didn't host activities, because I knew they would respond better if I shared an experience and opened up a door for them to have the same. Um, that's a very, great, very, very good question, considering the fact that every college campus is different. Um, my best answer would be there's no cookie cutter approach to the support for the U.S. is our relationship. Um, because at the end of the day, what I found is it's less about the facts. It's less about the policy. It's more about finding what matters to the individual that you're talking about. So you do your research. Um, and there's no, when I sit down with the president of the Black Student League, I'm not going to make the same argument as when I sit down with the pe president of the Penn Environmental Group or the president of the Spain Club at Penn because different things matter to each and every one of them. So I do my research, I find out a little bit more about them. In my first conversation with them, I don't even talk about Israel. I ask them what's in what interests them. I try to create a relationship, try to create a friendship. And after doing that, I find out how I can relate what happens in Israel to what happens to them and how I can relate the U.S. Israel relationship to them specifically. Um, so our campus is large. There's a lot of people on it. Well, mid-sized compared to some of the other campuses, but large for me. Um, there's a lot of different perspectives on my campus. There's a lot of different political views and religious views. But at the end of the day, the most important thing 
if you want to create a relationship, a lasting relationship, a lasting impact on someone in terms of their support for the U.S. Israel relationship, you have to do your research, find out what matters to them, and then go from there. There is something that we, we all pretty much say, and that is that um, speeches alone don't engage people, people engage people. Yeah. And uh, you might think that's uh, ironic in a convention center where we present you with or assault you with a whole lot of speeches, but um, we're still convinced that the magic happens in between the speeches amongst yourselves. Yeah. And that's certainly the case on campus. Certainly the case on campus. Yes. Hi, my name is Jason Shader Smith. I have I have a, two questions, but it's under the same umbrella on, on how to react to certain situations. So recently, uh, the American Studies Association endorsed a boycott um, against an Israeli academic institution. So I was wondering how each of your campuses responded and what your presidents have done to the situation. And uh, my second question is about uh, J Street. Uh, they recently um, are starting on our campus and trying to make a constitution. So I, we're not trying to figure out how we should respond and how to, friendly or we don't want to make it a competition, but it's sort of a, a struggle between us. So I just wanted to ask your, your opinions on that. So. Um the American Studies Association is a very small organization. The voting body that um, procured this vote that was present is even smaller. What we did on our campus is absolutely nothing in direct response, in public direct response. We worked with our administration. Our president sent a letter out. It was well received. The University of Wisconsin-Madison opposes divestment. And then we answered questions from college Dems, college Republicans, and student government leaders. But it wasn't an issue on our campus. So instead of making a public statement and bringing attention to it, we worked proactively to increase our relationships with student leaders, to increase our relationships with candidates, congressmen, and campus leaders, and make sure that they understood why we support the U.S.-Israel relationship, and they understood how this vote wasn't representative of the American studies across the country um, and that was 10 times more successful you know why be reactive to something that isn't making an impact on your campus um, absolutely I think that's something you've heard um, through that, throughout this entire panel and throughout this entire conference is that what APAC does is very very unique um, we have a very targeted approach we have very specific goals um, I think at the end of the day um, all of us are working towards peace. Um, J Street is as well. We have this common goal, but our methodologies are very, very different. Um, and for that reason, you know, we have a J Street on our campus. Um, they have very different conversations than the conversations that we have. Um, they meet with different leaders than the, than the leaders that we meet with. Um, we're all underneath the same umbrella. We meet together if there's something we need to discuss. But in general, we, we do our own thing. They don't lobby the con we don't lobby Congress people like they do that like we do. They don't release a leadership statement. They're more into having big events, whereas more we're into more personal reactions with people. Um, at the end of the day, um, the co-presidents of J Street signed our leadership statement, and whenever they have an issue to discuss, we meet with them. We sit down with them, very cordial relationship. Um, but no one steps on each other's toes, um, and I think it's really important important to remember that though our methodologies are different, um, we all share the same goal, um, which is a strong um, U.S.-Israel relationship, um, peace, and I would just say, you know, be their friend at the end of the day, that, that's what matters. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Khalid, and thanks, Lila. Great answers. Hi, my name is Gabby Bornstein, and I'm a student from UC Santa Cruz, and BDS, this is a hot topic, and it's coming to our, most likely coming back to our campus. We were able to fight it last year. It was an incredible feat on our part to be able to do that, um, but it was sort of a scattered effort and we want to come back stronger this year. So we're faced with an unfortunate situation in which, um, as someone had mentioned earlier, there are organizations who've been brought on board who have no idea what's going on. They empathize and they are, their heartstrings have been pulled by this idea that there is human rights violations that are occurring. And they hear that and they go, okay, well, that's a bad thing. I don't want that to happen. And here's a cause that's going to prevent that. Sign me up. Uh, literally sign this bill, you know. Um, and we don't want that to be something that we are unable to impact. So my question is, how do we reframe the picture? Okay, so thank you so much for being here, Gabby. Um, I think that the most crucial part of this is building relationships. If your student leaders know you 
and trust you and see you as a reliable, incredible pro-Israel advocate, but also as a friend, then you have the upper hand in anything that comes to campus. You know, I was never involved in student government in the summer. I sat, I sat on a student government panel at Saban with amazing student government reps and said, wow, they're all doing great things. I'm on this panel, I'm not on student government, maybe I should be, and I went back to campus and I applied to sit on student council and now I'm building those relationships as an equal and I can say, I understand how this campus works, I care about student life and I wanna work with you as a friend. And so much more credibility, they know who I am, they know who Badgers for Israel is, and we have an impact so that if BDS comes, and they talk to one of my fellow student council reps, they come to me instead of signing their bill, you know? And that's how you have the biggest impact, is going back to your campus and just emailing your leaders, hey, can we have coffee? Can we sit down and talk? I care about Israel, you represent me on campus. Your job is to hear my voice. Yeah, and just building upon that, so BDS is one thing, but then if you shift the paradigm a little bit, then you can open up a whole nother horizon. The concept of divestment will always be negative. But what about the concept of investment? One of the APAC initiatives last fall was IVEST. That means your university purchasing an Israeli product, cooperating with an Israeli institution, or bringing Israel on campus in some capacity like that. Like if you watched in the general session, Ofra Strauss of Strauss Products, she is owner of Sabra Humus. So what if you bring that to your dining commons? I mean, it's a, a small step, but you'll be investing in Israel. And I think that's much more positive and beneficial thing to do. And I'm gonna say one thing really fast, just building off what Omri said. Uh, my favorite thing to do, and we're talking about building relationships, it's not easy. It takes a lot of conversations, a lot of time. Um, it kind of took over my life, but totally worth it. Um, when I'm reframing, the, you're talking about reframing the conversation, push politics aside for a second. I will be the first to admit that I'm not a political expert, but I know a lot about Israeli technology and I know a lot about Israeli business and I know a lot about Israeli contributions to our um, to medicine and to research and to our security, um, especially when it comes to military technology. Make the conversation about that. A lot of what we heard about earlier today, talk about those things. I bet you they don't know about them and I bet you it's gonna make them care. Hi, my name is Seth Greenwald. I'm a representative from Clark University. Um, my question is also like Gabby's in terms of reframing the picture. This past week at school was Israeli Apartheid Week. And I consider myself very Zionist, but also very pro-Palestinian, pro-human rights. And over the course of the week, um, I got labeled as anti-human rights, as anti-Palestinian, as enforcing apartheid because I was wearing a birthright shirt. Um, so my question is, how do I reframe that picture to say I can be pro-Palestinian and I can be a Zionist at the same time when my whole school says otherwise? It seems like many of these BDS resolutions and the Israel Apartheid Week, they are taken entirely, entirely out of context. So you need to give your student leaders the entire picture. You need to inform them, Israel's history, the background. And you need to be sure in your convictions when you're teaching them these things. And it is a long conflict, and it is a difficult conflict. And APAC and the pro-Israel community is working to alleviate this conflict and to find a peaceful solution. Every day, they are working for that cause, and you should be too. And we believe that the strongest and best way to do so is through bilateral, direct negotiations that will find mutual recognition, a Jewish state next to a Palestinian state, and an end of conflict. And so you really need to give context to these people and engage your campus leaders and educate them with the history I'm sure you already know. Hi, um, I'm Ari. I also attend UCSB with Omri. Um, I sort of have a question that might end up getting the same sort of answer that you guys have been giving to everybody, but I wanted to frame it in a different sort of way. So a lot of us are on, on college campuses right now and I think we're experiencing a lot of the same things over the same issues. And I see this ideological framework and idea of um, Israel, the country that we know and love, as anti-human rights and anti-justice. And I think that really appeals to a lot of people on our campuses, and I think it appeals to our generation as a whole. And because our generation hasn't experienced the pain and the sacrifice of intifadas and violence or the Holocaust, um, we are in a different sort of mindset. We, as in like, the um, younger generation on college campuses. And I think we need to revamp our argument for Israel. Um, I was just speaking about this with Ari Shabit, but um, 
So I really want to know what you guys think should be done on our campuses. And I agree that we should be speaking to leaders, but I also think that we really need to influence the minds of our general public on our campuses because it's so important because we also influence those decisions. So um, what do you guys think we can do to really frame Israel as the good guy and as on that moral platform of high ground? I think the best way to illuminate this is through a story. This past semester, I was assigned a debate in a class by an anti-Israel progressive teacher. And the debate was set up to make me fail and to make Israel look like a human rights violator. And I was really upset by this. And I didn't think it was fair. And I was emotional. And I wrote a paper, an awful paper, the worst paper I've ever written. Um, and I was given a poor grade because I didn't think strategically. And I wanted everyone in my class to know how amazing Israel was. And I wanted everyone in my class to understand that you know, the way this argument was set up was wrong and that Israel isn't this aggressive human rights violator. And my TA worked with me and said, if you want to make a stronger argument, you need to look at what matters here. You know, I agree with you. It, it's terrible and it's upsetting to watch the general public on campus feel a certain way about Israel. But there are people on campus working f towards that. What I spend my time doing and what these panelists up here spend their time doing is focusing on those campus leaders because if you talk to the head of your environment student club, they're going to talk to their members. If you talk to the head of the LGBT rights group on campus, they're going to talk to their members. You know, We've gone and we presented at other clubs and it's trickled down that way. So we work as a top-down organization. It, it doesn't mean that you're not having an influence on the public. It means that you're spending your resources in a more strategic way to make a bigger impact. Hi, I'm Melissa Kirschenbaum from Omaha, Nebraska, and I'm a high school senior, and I go to a school of over 2,000 students, yet only 10 of them are Jewish. And so my question is, how did you and how can I get non-Jews um, to support Israel because they all have a negative um, view from the media? Find a common ground. You know, um, people do better when they know what we like the same. You know, find a common ground um, and make sure that the message that is, um, you know, told, that it's consistent. You know, keep the same consistent message because there are going to be people who are going to be fed information from other organizations um, that will um, promote an anti-Israel agenda. Um, but make sure that you keep your message very consistent um, and make sure that you do not grow weary in well-doing. Um, so continue. So find the common ground. Find the areas that they like, show them, of course, even as they said, educate them is the key. Um, education will allow them to really see um, what's really happening and, and the good things about the nation of Israel because um, there are plenty good, plenty good. Absolutely, and I agree 100% um, with everything you said. You continue doing the amazing work that you're doing. We would be pleased to send a complimentary DVD of this program to anyone who wishes to support Shalom TV with a tax-deductible gift of $36, double high or more, to the nonprofit organization Jewish Education in Media. Simply visit the Shalom TV website homepage and click on the Donate button to make a donation by PayPal or your credit card. And please indicate the program for which you would like a DVD. Or you can send your tax-deductible check made out to GEM, to Jem, Post Office Box 180, Riverdale Station, Bronx, New York, 10471. And again, please remember to indicate which program you would like to receive on DVD with our compliments. And we thank you for your kind support.